Hi, Sonia. Welcome to Brown Girls Read. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on. Such a pleasure. First Thanks. of all, we want to say, like, we loved your book, Beyond Words, both of us. <laughs> like, we just basically binged on it. So we really want to know how you came up with the idea to retell this story and what inspired you? Okay, well, it's, I'm so happy to hear that you both binged on it and you both <laughs> liked it that much. Um, it's always such a joy to hear that. Um, two things really, uh, one, um, I was, when I was growing up, I came across in my own independent reading, a speech by Thomas Babington Macaulay um, during the British Empire in which he was giving a speech to British Parliament in 1835. And in fact, the epigraph, one of the epigraphs of unmarriageable quotes from that particular speech in which he lays, um, suggests, recommends that throughout British empire, English should replace indigenous uh, languages. English should become the official language. And I realized suddenly um, the policy behind why I was speaking English, why in so many of the post-colonial, so-called post-colonial countries, English is being spoken. And that really, um, it took me by surprise. I'd never been taught that. And I was also very shocked and it was very unsettling. And um, I sort of wanted to do something about that, which is I've grown up in the Pakistani culture and I wanted to take the English language, which is an official language of Pakistan since 1947 after partition. But I wanted to take the English language I'd grown up with as well as the Pakistani culture I'd grown up with and um, do something with that um, in response to Macaulay's uh, policy. And Jane Austen has always been a favorite author of mine. And I remember the first time I read Pride and Prejudice, it seemed the quintessential uh, Pakistani novel. I mean, it's about a mother and five daughters and she's trying to get her daughters married off. Looks like in any way, shape <laughs> and form possible. And that was just, it was, it was just South Asia in a nutshell right there. Jane Austen didn't know she's Pakistani. In fact, I called, started calling her Jane Kala. So, um, <laughs> So when I, after reading uh, Macaulay's um, address to British Parliament I, and deciding that I wanted to write in response to that almost, I figured I'd take Pride and Prejudice and reset it in Pakistan. And in fact, during an interview, uh, Professor Nalini um, actually called it Macaulay's worst nightmare. <laughs> so I think um, the, the project I had in mind it came to pass because I don't think Unmeasurable could receive any bigger compliment really because it was recognized for what what I'd been trying to do so that was that was just wonderful so yeah, that's, that's why I wrote that's how the novel came about that's why I wrote it yeah even in the book you had you have mentioned like even in the story through Alice and Darcy you've mentioned that uh, how you know language can I mean, people are the same everywhere and languages are just a way to communicate and it shouldn't be that, you know, it should be so strict that one language has to dominate over the others. So that was, I think that was a really, uh, that it's good to see the backstory behind, behind that thought. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and one of the things that was super striking to me was the name of the book, Unmarriageable. And it's so striking and, you know, it just attracted me to the book even more. Uh, so how did you come up with the name? Um, in the most unmarriageable fashion, I was struggling um, about what to write the novel because I what to name the novel because I wanted a one word title. And I just and I titles can sometimes come to you immediately. But with this novel, it didn't come to me like that. And I was on a family vacation with my partner and my and in DC and I was insisting that a certain painting I wanted to see was at a certain museum and he was saying no it's at another museum and I walked off thinking to myself oh he's so un unmarriageable and I was like oh I have my title and immediately I turned and I was like oh thank you I have my title so <laughs> like I always like to joke you know um, your husband's partners like, others can you know they can come in use <laughs> marriage has its uses so that that's literally how the title came around oh that's that's awesome yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I love it because there's an inbuilt, inbuilt conflict in that word unmarriageable but also there isn't a single person who you know usually who, who who doesn't tell me that oh I'm unmarriageable or I've heard it from you know I've been told I'm unmarriageable and I'm like everyone is unmarriageable even the people married are unmarriageable so so yeah 
Well, that's like another universal truth right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone is unmarriageable. <laughs> um and also like so pride and prejudice has already been made into a a, a movie and it has al- also been made into a south asian movie which is bride and uh, prejudice with ashwarya rai but if you were to create a movie out of this book who would you want to star in it yeah i don't i i like to you know when movies are made and actors are cast then then all of a sudden for a lot of readers there's a face to the characters and so far I, i've never done that i don't want to do that in fact sometimes i'll i'll try to avoid the movies and what not before i read a book because i don't want that person's face on the story i mean sometimes you can't avoid that so i i haven't i i haven't really thought about um as such who i think someone would really like the cover someone with really short hair I think for me that's that's quintessentially Alice which is just really short hair and very curly hair and she keeps it shorter than like sometimes in in you know in in Pakistan India etc Bangladesh and South Asia we um we'll still you know we'll cut our hair short but it's always a bob and it's always you know it's always sleek and stuff but Alice has got a really really short short haircut um and the cover was originally supposed to have a buzz cut but but that's as short as they go <laughs> so So yeah no I, I totally been... agree with you Sonia yeah. like when they put the face to the story it sometimes yeah. takes away your experience as a reader like I have a copy of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice but it's the paperback edition with the movie poster on it and I hate yeah. it so much <laughs> like honestly hate it yeah <laughs> yeah especially especially if it's someone sometimes that you don't necessarily you know are all that fond of But the thing is like even with this particular cover like my um my hardback cover is this blue one over here <laughs> you know and it doesn't have any faces or anything and I and I'd asked for peacocks um in in um in homage to uh, one of uh, Austin's most popular covers um which has this lovely peacock tail on it so I wanted I wanted peacocks on it and this is what they gave me and I told them no faces so when it came to the paperback they gave me faces <laughs> and i was like okay it's because even this can sort of you know people can it it's sort of imprinting in a way instead of letting your imagination go free and decide who what what your characters look like what they might be wearing and stuff but it's okay i i i think i i was okay with this cover because even though it gives us faces it still doesn't face to spoil anything that we want to imagine or anyone we want to imagine but um yeah. But yeah i mean the beautiful thing is if a movie is made of something that's wonderful but yeah sometimes the downside can be that but it could be an upside for a lot of people too so it just depends what sort of a reader you are do you like to imagine a certain actor and their face when you're reading or not so it can go both ways yeah that's true i think a lot of the movies a lot of the books that have been turned into movies and when i see like because in my mind there's a different face of the character when i read the book Yeah. and when i see like a super famous star like portrayed in that like starring in that movie i'm like oh this is not supposed to be that character <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i think also i feel like these days no matter what movie you make like if you make a south asian movie it's going to be dev patel and i don't want to <laughs> yeah. see another movie with him <laughs> well, yeah i i dev has the ability to look very different in a lot of different roles so he's very versatile in that way which i guess is really good because you some you, ne- you never quite expect which avatar he's going to show up in yeah i also have a book question for you sure. um you've written all these characters so beautifully Thanks. but is there a favorite for you you know i i i like everyone everyone is my favorite in little ways even the villains are my favorite in little ways because i don't know maybe i wrote them so i feel i i i have a special connection to all of them i think perhaps in in this particular in unmarriageable um i would say kitty maybe because um you know she's a uh, well she's she's um she's fighting against fat phobia or at least a mother and one of her sisters really bullies her about being you know not what they think of as some ideal body type which has been told to them by society and magazines and movies and stuff and kitty is not she's the only sister 
in these five sisters who actually um, is, is, is a plus size girl. And um, she wants to find pride in her body. And that can be very hard if you've got family members like her mother and maybe her sister Lydia, who are constantly putting her down for that. And I, you know, there's nothing in Unmarriageable that Kitty hasn't heard that I haven't heard actually. So every insult you, she, she gets in there, every, everything, I've, 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 I've heard it personally. And in fact, I chose not to use the more, the more terrible ones because I said, no one's going to believe this, that people can be so harsh and have no filter. But, but I think the, the, uh, the culture depicted in the novel and South Asian culture in general sometimes tends to have no filter. You know, people will just say, people you barely know, you're meeting them at a wedding for the first time and they'll let you know exactly what they think of you, looks wise, this wise, or, or you know, like, or, or sometimes you're, you're on a plane going somewhere and people will want to know, what's your job or what's your husband's job? How much do you make? How much do whatever? Like they ask, there's no filter. They just ask, are you married? To whom? If you're not married, why not? It's like, I, I came out to college in the US. So I've had plenty, I would go back um, to Pakistan winter and summer so I've had plenty of absolute strangers sitting next to me asking me the most absurd things and 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 so um you know so it's, it's a fairly filterless culture like that and you know there are a lot of people who um are a bit shocked that how can people be so mean to kitty and say such things and I'm like <laughs> I think a lot of Pakistani girls hear a lot of things and perhaps Indian girls also hear a lot of things which are not polite <laughs> To be yeah, I love out. Kitty too. Uh, probably <laughs> also because I've heard a lot of that, and I don't doubt any of that is like you know created out of thin air. Yeah, yeah. So, so she's she's one of my favorites because I think she still manages to, um, you know, she still manages to find herself and 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 speak up for herself, especially by the end. But I like them all. I mean, Lady is a terrible character. She's very self. <laughs> into herself and she can be quite mean but you know but um but there are moments of her which are she's 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 so young she's just 15 in the novel and um you know hopefully she'll grow but there's a moment in there with lady also where um she's on the dance floor at the nadir feed wedding and she's a, she's a guest she doesn't she's not a personal you know she's not a relative she's not a close family friend but she starts to dance and they take her off the dance floor and that happened to me when I was younger I was like <laughs> <laughs> so you know I, I connected with all of the characters in, in in little ways in different ways or or the character of um Annie who is um a, a mirror character of um, Jane Austen's Anne de Berg. And in Pride and Prejudice, Anne de Berg doesn't say a word at all. She's completely silent. And I wanted to change that around. So Annie speaks a lot in the book. She's, you know, she has her own opinion. She's, um, you know, she's, she's a disabled character in the novel. And I, I wanted to give a voice to, to, to Anne, Anne de Berg and my Annie through that. So I tried to put a lot of different things in, in Unmarriageable, but also a quick uh, note, uh, just that um, Unmarriageable is actually a parallel retelling of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. So because I wanted to, you know, write back to Macaulay, write back to that policy, I didn't do a sequel, prequel, or inspired by, I literally took um, Pride and Prejudice and I set it in Pakistan. So, um, you know, you'll see all the characters, all the plot of uh, Pride and Prejudice, but there are new characters also, uh, like um, Mr. Bennett's brother in, in Unmarriageable. And, um, you know, there's all five of the Bennett sisters have their own issues going on. Like I said, Kitty's fighting fat phobia. Lady it just wants to have a good time. But what does a good time mean in a culture which is so, um, you know, which prescribes what it means to be a good girl, you know? don't laugh too loudly, don't have too much fun, your reputation matters. And not just your reputation matters, but if you do something, it's going to have an effect on your sisters or your family. So poor lady, she just wants, you know, if she'd perhaps been born in some other place, time, culture, it might have been different. She just wants to have fun, but she gets into, you know, she she gets into a pickle because of that, because of where she is. Um, you know, so so even though it's a parallel retelling, it's also very much its own novel. So even if you have not read 
Pride and Prejudice, if you know nothing about Jane Austen, it's still a book that you can read and enjoy. And so... Yeah. And since we're on the, like, you know, the characters, one of the characters that I loved was Sherry. And yeah, yeah, you know, like I all imagined uh, that Sherry would emerge out to be like a very courageous woman who would break the barriers uh, of the society and, you know, shun these norms of marriages (laughs) and, you know, she'll be like, okay, so I am not going to get married. um, And I I would just, you know, start something of my own or something like that. I, I thought that would be the ending like that would be her character's you know progression but she ended up choosing Farhat Khalil mm-hmm. um, which is actually also super realistic and that's why you know the novel <laughs> is so realistic because girls who are ambitious and you know who are very brave and courageous in our South Asian cultures they end up you know somehow somewhere like compromising uh, their dreams or for various reasons so yeah. Yeah, You know, I, I'm not going to call it a compromise. I think it's a compromise if you don't want to get married and then you end up marrying someone or anyone at all. That is a compromise. I think if you want to get married, I do, you know, I think, I think sometimes we confuse wanting to get married with settling down because, you know, we're so often grown up being uh, bought up, being told, settle down, settle down, just settle down. So sometimes we often make the huge mistake of just settling down rather than perhaps waiting for who we really might want to be with. Um, And unfortunately, again, that comes uh, with a a culture which is so heavily invested in marriage. I call it the marriage industrial complex in Pakistan (laughs) because um, marriage is so important. But the thing is, Alice never says she doesn't want to get married. She just doesn't want to marry the wrong person. Same with Sherry. It's not that she doesn't want to get married. She just, she wants to marry someone that you know, she sees that she can have a future with. The thing also is that in Muslim culture in in Pakistan, uh, which is a Muslim majority uh, uh, country, um, in Muslim culture, you uh, premarital sex is a crime. It's a sin. So in order to have sex and in order to then have children, or at least in order to well, in order to have sex, you have to get married. (laughs) So, So a lot of people, you know, a lot of Men, women or or and men who are who are religious, then obviously you do have to get married for that reason. And as I've shown uh, Sherry in the book, she absolutely would like to indulge in, <laughs> in in those activities. So for her, you know, I, she gets married for that for for a lot of a lot of reasons. You know, when I first read Pride and Prejudice, um, everyone always says, and rightly so, that Elizabeth Bennet is the you know, she's a she's a modern girl and progressive girl, and, and she is, of course. But I always found Charlotte, her friend, who is Sherry and unmarriageable, I always found Charlotte to be equally so. Because um, number one, uh, the way Austin writes it, Charlotte receives that, okay, Elizabeth, her friend, does not want to marry Mr. Collins, but he's good enough for her. She's happy being married to him. So she she almost makes him propose to her, you know. She orchestrates it. She sees him. She sees him walking down the lane from her bedroom window, and she meets him accidentally. And next, we know they're getting married. And I always remember I always used to read that, and I'd be so curious what happened between these two lines, you know? What did she say to him? How did this happen? And I wanted to an unmarriage bill um, write in between those lines. I wanted to give Sherry, you know. I wanted to make Sherry, a, uh, I wanted to fill in that story. What happened to Sherry? How did she end up getting married? Why did she want to get married, etc.? What does it mean within this particular country and culture to get married? I think one of, I think my most saddest moment in writing Unmarriageable was actually when, um, when Sherry goes, I really was sad, I, and I'm going to try not to cry right now, but it's when Sherry goes to meet Prince, you know, she's engaged, and she goes in to meet Principal Nahid to, te- and, uh, to tell her that she's planning to not work, to quit, and, um, and Prince, she sees, and Principal Nahid notices who she's marrying, and suddenly her tone changes, you know, because she was going to tell Sherry, you're responsible, how dare you, and suddenly when she sees that she's marrying the so-called VIP, her, you know, she's suddenly polite and, and Sherry goes into the bathroom and cries because she realizes that in this culture, it's not just getting married. Unfortunately, it's also who you're getting married to, you know. So there's so much pressure put on girls often that, you know, yes, get married, get married. But then who are you going to marry? What's so, so, you know, keep your reputation good. Be pretty. Don't cut your hair. Don't do this. Don't do that. 
be be a good girl be on your best behavior because somehow some stupid prince some rich prince is going to come and descend on me it's so there's so many nets and webs and stuff that are cast internally and psychologically on girls and it's sometimes very hard for them for for often for people to break free but but i wanted to explore um you know what freedom what freedom means within within the culture that i've grown up in and and the culture that we find in um, in pakistan today when it comes to okay. and i think even like with sherry like what you said like you wanted to show them like show the readers the meaning of freedom in a culture that does not support freedom for women too much i think she finds her own freedom in some way right like she gets she she like she breaks the shackles of whatever was holding her and she finally goes out and you know makes uh farat kalin propose to her and then she gets married and then she was happy like this was this was like a yeah. good you know like yeah. a good i mean i wanted to do some i wanted to write a few subversive things also right because often mm-hmm. we think oh if you get married then you you know like you you use the word right. then you've settled down and you've made the wrong choice and if you're you know if you're a modern girl or a progressive woman or this that and the other then you sh- you perhaps don't want to get married and i don't think anyone everyone wants some sort of companionship i mean whether you're straight lgbtq whatever you know everyone wants a partner companion um uh so and i wanted to show that uh you can you can be career oriented you can have your sherry's working she earns in contemporary part unlike in austin's time where women absolutely did have to get married because they couldn't they weren't you know they couldn't work so marriage was there was you know marriage was not love marriage was very much financial security stability which is where marrying the best possible you know came up but in unmarriage bill in um contemporary pakistan women are so many women are highly educated or so many women have so many options to make a living and not necessarily have to get married but i wanted cherry to get married i wanted my characters to get married because it's not marriage that we're necessarily um uh, you know marriage is not the issue uh the issue is being forced emotionally into getting married into you know your age you're now 25 it's too late you're getting older right. just marry whatever so those are the sort of things i subversively wanted to address not that you know uh, you know like oh feminists don't want to get married of course they mm-hmm. do who doesn't want to get married i mean some some women don't want to get married some men don't want to get married and that's perfectly fine i think you've done it very beautifully because we Thank were talking you. about the book Thank earlier you. and there's just so much to unpack and being <laughs> from india we just related to so much of the cultural nuance yes, that yes. is in the book all the little things about how parents are how society forces you how even as girls you can feel either pressured or confused into realizing what what it is that you actually want to do Absolutely. are you doing it because of pressure or is it yes. something you really really want yes absolutely and that and that's and that is that is that is that is why i wrote on marriageable also because i wanted to explore what freedom means in in this context i don't think there's anyone who hasn't read on marriage bill and been like oh my god that's that that's either my mother or that sort of like my mother or, or this is this is you know this is what i grew up with also which is which is very nice to hear but very sad to process because i'm like oh my yeah. god <laughs> you know um yeah, we are all just like children of patriarchy right most of the cultures are patriarchal yeah, and this is a product of it right even even the ones you know like in 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 and in the cultures which we might not think of as being children of the patriarchy um what what i've seen happen you know where where marriage has sort of lost that thing like like in certain cultures you don't you can live together you don't have to get married right you've still found someone but you're living together you're not married per se the next pressure i see seems to be when you're going to have a child oh i want to be a grandmother or oh, whatever so there's always some sort of at least that's what i've noticed some sort of pressure somewhere which makes sense also i guess maybe parents would like to have grandchildren you know grandparents would like to have grandchildren on the other hand it's still a pressure you know and yeah. so you know how where do where 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 how how does one unravel this what does it mean to stay true to yourself Mm-hmm. and all these things you know it's it's the age old thing about community versus individuality community can be a lovely thing until it's suffocating and individuality can also be a lovely thing um you know if you are in a place which allows that to flourish rather than branding you as um you know 
all sorts of horrible things which you're not. <laughs> so That's yeah, I tried true. to yeah, I tried to bring all that in Ahmed. Um so yeah. Um, Sonia, so we are a book podcast and we read a lot. So one of our f- favorite questions is asking our guests what their reading habits are. So what's your favorite genre to read and what are some of the books that are you reading right now? Oh my goodness. I love to read everything. I, I, I try to stay away from the horror genre just because I don't, I don't watch horror movies really and I don't, um, and I don't read horror just because I don't want those things in my head whether it's ghosts or whether it's just any of that stuff and the older I'm getting the less I want that around other than that I read I read if it's recommended to me enough by people I trust I will read absolutely anything I tend to for the longest time I tended towards um, books about books which explored um, nationalism and patriarchy uh, patriarchy also but patriotism and uh, wars and um, what it means to survive in civil wars and in international wars, to go through very traumatic experiences and to somehow come out of them. And what does survival mean? What does trauma mean? I was sort of drawn to books like that. I really, you know, be it set in 1947, be it set in the Holocaust. I mean, my favorite authors, I have to say at least the ones that have influenced me the most are, are um, definitely Thomas Hardy, uh, E.M. Forster and Austin, but I also absolutely love um, Virginia Woolf, um, Edith Wharton, uh, Scott Fitzgerald. I love I love a lot of different authors. So I read a lot of I, I I do I do I read contemporary also, but I go back and I read a lot of a lot of those things um, too. Yeah. <laughs> And are you writing anything right now? Any new book we can hope for? I am writing too many things. And because of that, I'm also writing nothing. (laughs) 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 Which is the absolute truth. I don't know what's happened to my attention span. I move from one thing to another thing, then come back, then stare at the page, then go back, then come and go. And I don't know if anything, if whatever finally comes to the end, whichever, whatever the hell comes to the end is what I will have written. And I just... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I like how honest this answer is. <laughs> and it's just, I, I, you know, I've had lots of agents. I've seen the publishing world in, in all its various um, <laughs> um, forms. And it's been very hard. And I think when Unmarriageable finally came out and people started reading it and loving it and just word of mouth has been phenomenal. I mean, I don't know how you guys came to it, right? It's we're in 2021. And, and um, I think and, I found the audiobook a while ago. And I don't okay. know, maybe the title was the reason. Okay, and I listened you, to the right. And I've been telling every single person, please right. find so, the audiobook. So, <laughs> Audio is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So, you know, so there you go. There's a bit of word of mouth for you there. And, and, and people, you know, people were reading it. And I, like I said, I struggled so much to finally get published. And I just wanted to enjoy it. You know, I who you just never you never know with life, right? <laughs> and I was like, let me just let me just let me let me not worry about another book right now, another whatever. Let me just enjoy what I have right now. And that enjoyment has been one year, two year, now third year. <laughs> and I'm now finally at the point where I'm like, okay, enough enjoyment. <laughs> let's, go, because, let's, let's go write something. So happy that you became a writer because we loved reading this book and we would love to read <laughs> yeah. more from you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dhamma. Thank you, you know, Sonia, so-, so much for joining us. Yeah. Like this has been great talking to you and hearing you talk about your book and your writing process. It's always great to know like behind the scenes stories from the authors <laughs> that we love. And yeah. we're looking forward to your next book. So thank you so much. But now, no pressure, now Sonia. Yeah, I was about to say no pressure. <laughs> Hopefully one day. But um, <laughs> but yeah, no, thank you so much for saying that. You know, um, so many, so many, so many. I get so many messages about unmarriageable, um, sometimes publicly, but so often privately also, where you know, girls, girl, you know, women, girls will say that this book has just just they've seen themselves in it, you know. And, and what that means to them because they, they're struggling in marriages they didn't maybe want or they're younger and they're struggling against mothers or families who want to push them in a certain direction and, and, and they love Alice and they love everyone 
And, and you know, yes, I didn't want to be a writer, but okay. <laughs> I'm not going to complain. Being able to, you know, when I was young, books meant everything to me. Books were my parents. Books were everything to me. Um, so, you know, when you become a writer or when you write something, you know, I think for most writers, the thing is, even if I change, you know, if I'm even if I'm able to bring a smile or a thought to one person's life, then, you know, I've, I've accomplished something. And at this point, I've beyond accomplished something. So I honestly, it's tremendous to have a book that people love so much. It's I'm still processing it. I didn't expect <laughs> it. So, 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 yeah, that's I a beautiful everyone, yeah, that's a beautiful message, I think. Yeah, thank uh, you. I hope everyone in, in, in India, Pakistan, South Asia, etc., does read it. It was written for you. It was written for Pakistanis, for Indians. It was written for us girls who come from this culture and for everyone who can relate to it. But I wanted to give, you know, yes, we can read Austin and Pride and Prejudice, but I wanted to give something which, you know, you can, we can see our faces, our colors, our issues. Definitely our problems, our lives. And it's a fun book. It's a funny book, right? Yeah. And they're going to plays, they're (laughs) jogging in parks, they're arguing about boys, all sorts of things. So it has its serious stuff, but it's a funny, fun book. I don't want anyone to think, oh, but, uh, but you know, but it's written for, it's written for all us brown girls. So thank you for having me on your wonderful (laughs) podcast. Thanks for joining us, Sonia. Thanks for joining us, Sonia. Thank you so much.